Hope everybody's doing well today. I want to welcome everybody to the Unimpressed Podcast. And we have a friend calling in from Las Vegas, and his name is Mike J. Powell. And he wrote a book called Escaping the Kill Zone. And he's got some interesting stories to talk about with his life in and out of law enforcement. Welcome to the show, Mike. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. So, you know, Mimi filled me in a little bit talking about you coming up through school and you know, there was some emotional things you carried with you and felt like you're always trying to prove something in this industry, your private investigation industry. What makes you want to do this stuff? And, and why did you feel like you had to prove something? Well, I have learning differences, learning disabilities. So when I was a kid, I was made fun of. Uh, we used to have to stand and read aloud, and I basically stumble over every word until the class you know, started laughing. And then in the schoolyard, I became a punching bag to the bullies. That went on for a couple years. I kept it from my, you know, my family. And one day, interestingly enough, when I was seven years old, I was upstairs. We had a two-story house, and I was looking out front, and a yellow taxi cab pulled up. My Aunt Pauline just arrived with her new husband straight out of the penitentiary. His name was Bobby Wood. Ten years earlier, he was the number 10th uh, lightweight in the world. And they moved in with us. He picked up very quickly that I was being bullied and said, come on, we're going to the YMCA and we're joining a youth boxing group, which I did, and uh, youth wrestling. And what did that entail? It entailed uh, boxing matches, I mean, in a ring and wrestling. Uh, you know, that we did that for a while. There were two, two main bullies. They just didn't pick on me. They picked on a lot of different kids. And one day he came up the room, I was making a model, a little car model gluing things together and he says okay i think you're ready and i said ready for what and he says tomorrow you're going to fight those two guys one at a time and so the next day was kind of like high noon i was watching the clock tick you know as it went closer and closer to three o'clock and i got scared and i ran out the door and i ran home and ran past him and went upstairs and he came up and said what's wrong and i said i'm scared and he asked me why i said i'm afraid they're going to beat me up and he says they're already beating you up every day we went down and everyone knew who he was. I'm a talker, so all the kids in school knew who he was. And the two guys came by and, hi, Mike, how you doing? Like, we're old buddies. And so he told them he knew what was going on and that they were picking on kids in the neighborhood. And he said, I've been training Mike down at the YMCA and uh, he's going to fight you guys one at a time. Who's first? And of course, they didn't step up. They both said they were sorry. They never bothered me again. Interesting enough, I ran into both of them as adults. They both just, they both were in prison multiple times. And they introduced me to their wives as one of their best friends growing up. I thought that was kind of interesting. So at school, in high school, when I went to high school, I went in a different area of the high school. And of course, there were new bullies there. And they'd come by and knock the books out of your hands. And like I said, just not me. They'd shove kids into their locker when they were looking in. And one day, one of them just said, me and you in the alley at 3 o'clock today. And I guess I had enough. I said, OK, I'll see you there. And when I, we were walking on two sides of the street towards the alley, he had about, looked like, 15 to 20 people following him and cheering him on. On my side, I had like two of my buddies and they were trailed about 15 feet behind me. And it wasn't much of a fight. He he, he didn't know how to fight. And so uh, when it was over, we walked back to school, a gym teacher stopped it. And I had about 20 people following me and he had about two people following him back. And I never got bullied again in school. Now your parents, where, where were your parents from? My parents are, are from, my father never knew his father, was born in Bisbee, Arizona. His mother, you know, drank a lot and stuff. And when he got, when he was, um, he didn't he didn't really explain this stuff to us. So my mother explained about my father. His mother kicked him out of the house when he was 11. And he went from foster care to foster care to group homes. And when he got older, he got in trouble with the law. And back then, the judge used to say things like this. He said, uh, you can go to jail or you can join the army. And my dad joined the army, became a paratrooper and served in Korea. He didn't talk much about it. The interesting thing was about two weeks before he died, he was going blind from diabetes. And I was there talking to him and, and he said he was uh, in a truck. This is the first time he talked about the military to me. He was in a truck with seven other guys at night driving through rice paddies. He was driving and the lieutenant was sitting next to him. And the lieutenant said he wanted to take over driving. 
And my dad said, no, I'm fine. He goes, no, no, we got to share whatever. And uh, they switched. And the next thing you know, my dad fell asleep. So the next thing you know, we were tumbling over a cliff. Everyone died except him. He was like 90 years old and saying he didn't understand why he lived and everyone else didn't. Hmm. Well, the reason I ask these things is because to do what you did in your career, I mean, I think there's a certain tone, a certain makeup of an individual, because I think that there's a reason you do what you do. And looking at that, have you ever thought about anything like that, about there's a certain type of personality and certain type of person that applies to do this type of work? Well, you know, one of the things that I discovered was, you know, being dyslexic, and I'm really bad at it. I discovered uh, when my draft number came up, I joined the Marine Corps Reserves, and I was a cop at the same time, and I learned that I was really good, really, really good at certain things, shooting weapons, hand-to-hand combat, all that kind of stuff. So I felt like early on that here's something I'm good at instead of, you know, judging myself on reading problems or spelling problems or, you know, basically school altogether. And so um, I kind of excelled in that field and kind of followed it in. I actually became an LAPD officer by accident. A friend of mine went to take the test and he didn't tell me he was going. I was in his pickup truck with him. And when we got to the police station, I waited in the lobby and a sergeant came walking by and said, hey, you're going to miss the test. It's going to start. I said, oh, I'm not here to take the test. My friend's upstairs taking it. And he said, well, if you're here, you might as well take the test instead of sitting around. So I went up and walked in a room and there were about 30 guys in there and probably about five or six of them I knew from high school I hung around with. And we took the test and after they graded it, they came back and they said, if I call your name, leave the room. And they called two or three people. Then they called Mike Powell. And I got up, my heart sunk again. There's another, you know, let down in like standing up and reading aloud as a kid. And as I walked out the door, One of my so-called buddies said, better luck next time, Powell. And when I went outside, the three people that were called before me were standing with the sergeant who took me up there. And when we got about five guys out there, he said, you guys passed. They failed. A couple of months later, I was in the police academy. Interesting. So you're in the police academy and you, you go through the training and so forth. What was the first gig or first thing you did that was a little bit jarring? Well, when I got out of the police academy, I was assigned to Newton Division, uh, the north end of South Central LA. They call it Shoot Newton because that's where the SLA shootout happened. That's where the Black Panther shootout happened. And uh, ultimately, uh, two of my shootings occurred there. And a couple of things happened that were pretty jarring. And and in my book, I write in detail, by the way, my book's called Escaping the Kill Zone. And I write in detail and it gets kind of gory, but my intention was to make people understand and feel like they're there, to understand what cops go through. If you see the news, even when the homicide detectives arrive, you know, it's, it's all over and now it's just investigating. So one of the first things that was kind of jarring is my partner and I were about three in the morning, got a call. I'm in uniform. I'm still a rookie and had a, a robbery in progress at a gas station. So we rolled up, parked next to the gas station. We got out, looked around. There was no one there, but there was red water flowing from the bathroom, the men's room of the gas station. And As we all know, there are steel doors on those bathroom doors and gas stations. So uh, we were trying to get in, a lot of water flowing out. Being young, I decided to go around back, climb up on the roof. There's a transit window on top of the door. And I went over and bashed it out with, with my nightstick and looked in. And the sink was off the wall and water was spraying in the air. And there were about two feet of water, murky reddish water. And I can see in the toilet part that there was someone in there. And I told my partner, there's someone in there. I'm going to try to get in and to see what's going on. So I hung and kind of shimmied myself in and dropped into the water. I remember my, my wool pants soaking up the water, my military combat boots filling with water. And I waded my way over. I was getting sprayed. I opened the toilet door and there was someone laying the uh, gas station tenant was laying like on his chest on the toilet, his head hanging over, almost like if someone was sick, throwing up, but a little further. And as I leaned over him, the top of his skull had been blown off and his uh, brains were hanging out about two to three inches. So I leaned back and I yelled to my partner, he's dead. And just then I hear a swishing noise in the water. 
and he grabbed my ankle. And I remember the rooms almost started to spin. I had to grab onto the wall and he started moaning. So by this time, my partner had already called for an ambulance and the fire department and the ambulance got there first. Well, they couldn't climb up and get in for whatever reason. And so they said, you're going to have to start first aid. So they threw saline solution bags to me and gauze and they guided me through it. They said, straddle him, pour the saline solution over his skull, don't touch his brains. And then they told me to get both hands, cup them together on his forehead, move his head back and slightly jiggle it until the brains get into his head. And then I bandaged it up. And then a few minutes later, the fire department arrived and they tore the door down in like a tidal wave, all that water, which was Cab high because rushing out. And that, that was pretty jarring. Although growing up, I've seen people get shot and I've seen dead people. So interesting. I hope that's I mean, not too jarring. <laughs> well, well, the thing is, is when you think about humanity and you think about experiences, you know, it's, it's what is a person going to carry with him, you know, from these experiences? You know, if you, that's one of your first experiences, you know, how do you? carry that weight and how do you keep going to pick up more weight you know in these circumstances well you know one one of the things you know there's you know this a war against cops has been going on for years and stuff and one reason i wrote the book as detailed as i did is because i i really truly believe that people don't understand what cops do you know i've heard senators and congressmen and even the president say well why don't they shoot them in the leg you know kind of ridiculous things and uh until you're there and, and you see it, you don't understand. So I, as I said, I wrote the book in detail. Some of the things that haunted me aren't so much the, the when it comes to kids, uh, and I think all police officers and friends of mine have talked it. when it comes to kids, that's the thing that stays with you for 20, 30 years, you know, uh, and you think about them and you think about where they are now. And, and also, you know, the, one of the things that is controversial is they want to send people to family disputes who are not cops, maybe social workers or people like that to de-escalate it. Well, you know, more cops have been killed in family disputes than you can imagine. I had an incident still in the same division, still as a rookie. We got a call of a family dispute early Sunday morning, someone yelling at each other. And interestingly enough, we were one house away in our car when we got the call. So we were there. And we walked upstairs and walked down the hallway. We can hear people shouting. And I got to the door and I raised my hand to knock and a gunshot rang out in, in the house. So I booted the door open and here's the husband standing there with a smoking gun in his hand. We ran in with our guns out, got him down, handcuffed him. And I looked to my left and there's three kids, two of them in diapers, one about four years old, two in diapers. They're screaming, it's echoing off the walls. It was crazy. And I looked to my left and here's the mother laying on the floor and it looked like she was dressed to go to church. So I ran over, I moved over there and I looked in her, it was soaking, soaking up blood in her chest. So I, I told her, I said, I'm going to have to open your blouse and take a look. And I opened the blouse and she had a sucking chest wound. So I knew I needed to put something uh, non-porous over it. And I uh, saw a cereal box on, on the table. It was breakfast time. So obviously the kids were going to have cereal and I yanked the cereal box. I ripped it apart and took the wax paper, folded it in fours and put it over her wound, put her dress over it. And then I applied pressure. Well, the kids are climbing on my back and screaming. Of course they want, and they're yelling, mommy, mommy. So this, this is the kind of things that bother me is the kids. I look back over my shoulder and she grabbed my collar and pulled me in. And she looked at me and said, uh, promise me you'll take care of my kids promised me. And then she passed. And it's interesting. You can almost feel the energy leave her body like she becomes not a person. She becomes an object. And when she died, I had to pry her fingers open to get them off my collar. And a lot of times, I mean, throughout the years, I always wonder what happened to those kids, those three kids. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel a little guilty because I feel like they should know that the last thing she worried about was them. Mm -hmm. Like what kind of neighborhood was this in? This is South Central Los Angeles. South Central. So, you know, as a young guy, did you have any fear rolling up into South Central and and saying, hey, this is my gig now. This is my job. Was there any fear that 
you know, you worried about, you know, because, you know, a lot of people, you know, won't admit it, but, you know, that's a lot to think about. Yes. You know, the, the thing people have asked me, you know, as I said before, uh, talk to your wife, I've, you know, been undercover in the mafia. I've done a lot of things that people say, well, weren't you scared? Weren't you scared? You know, it's kind of a complex uh, question because, uh, as everyone knows, when you become fearful, your mind starts to shut down, your brain starts to shut down d different areas of your brain to concentrate on what it's dealing with. But when it does that, you're taking away a lot of options, possible options that you can have. But but I think is it's not like I woke up one day and said, hey, I think I'm going to be a cop and be in this shootout, or I'm going to go undercover in the mafia. It's when in the Marine Corps boot camp, training with weapons, and then going on the police department, being seeing this, seeing shootouts, and, and it only it doesn't only happen like in South Central LA. One of the most devastating things that put me in therapy for over fifty years ha happened on Wilshire Boulevard in West Los Angeles between Beverly Hills and Santa Monica, a very high priced area. Mm -hmm. And I was by myself and uh, I worked a plainclothes unit for a lot of years, a zebra unit. But when your partner went to court, you can't work by yourself because we work as we basically hunt people. We don't get radio calls. We uh, unmark cars. We have a radio. We can hear what's going on around the city, but we basically hunt. Homicide detectives would say, uh, hey, we're looking for this guy's wanted for murder. Give us a picture, a rundown of where his friends live, his grandmother lives or whatever. And uh, we hunted, and that's what we, we did. But my partner had to go to court to testify, so I was by myself, and a call came out, a 415 man, shots fired, and that meant that someone was acting crazy, shooting off a gun. And I rolled in that direction, thinking, you know, I'll never, I won't get there in time, because it was kind of far away. When I rolled up across the street, there was a restaurant, there was a motel that was U-shaped, and there was a restaurant across the street called the bicycle cafe. And there were about 20 people out there screaming and pointing across the street. So I stopped the car. I don't know why I grabbed the shotgun. I went code six there telling the RTO that I'm there. I looked up and I could see two bodies in the parking lot face down. So I requested an ambulance and backup. And then I went in the opposite direction to where all the people were. And I asked the lady, did you see what happened? I'm checking to see you know, what I'm getting into. And she said, some guy shot those two guys, jumped in a Cadillac, and he took off that way towards the beach. We we're only a couple of miles from the beach. So I went down, you know, 20, 30 feet, and there was a young kid there, a young kid teenager. And I asked him, did you see what happened? He goes, yeah, some dude shot that, those two dudes and jumped in a caddy convertible, white, and he went towards the beach. So I felt like, okay, the guy's gone. And I kind of jogged across the street, and I squatted down like a catcher and put the shotgun across my thighs. I bent over and I put my hand, they're both face down to feel a carotid artery, and a shadow came over me from behind and very calm voice said, put down your gun or I swear to God, I'll kill this baby. And I said, um, I was 26 years old at the time. Mm -hmm. I didn't look back, I talked loud enough so I thought he can hear me. And I said, um, I'm not putting my weapon down, I'm gonna turn around and we're gonna talk. And as I stood up, I remember saying to myself in my mind, turn to the left, the barrel of the shotgun is left. And I raised it and turned and faced him and looked like a lawyer, a 35 year old lawyer in a Brooks Brothers suit. So it wasn't South Central LA. And mm -hmm. he had a baby, eight month old baby in a diaper with a gun in its ribs and the hammers cocked back. And we danced in the parking lot. I, I felt like I couldn't pull the trigger because the shotgun, the further away you are, as you probably know, the, the wider the pellet spread is and I was afraid to hit the baby so I moved to my left he moved to his right and he was rambling the whole time and I stepped forward he'd step backwards his eyes were getting glassy and I guess the best way I could put it with I, I write in detail exactly what happened but for for your show I think I should say things did not end well mm -hmm. so he pulled the trigger and killed the kid yes and who was this guy did you ever find out who this guy was Yes. I mean, since since you've said it, all, uh, what happened was, is I realized we didn't wear vests back then. W when I was talking to him and we were moving, I realized I couldn't get a position if I had to pull the trigger. I was afraid if I shot his legs out or something, if I had to, that with a hammer back, a gun, a, a, a pistol like that has about six pounds of trigger pull. Well, mm -hmm. when the hammer's back, it's cut in half. So it's about three pounds of trigger pull. So a jerk could fire the weapon. So I thought I can't protect myself. 
I kept telling him the baby had nothing to do with this. Please put the baby down and let's talk. And I heard a woman screaming, my baby, my baby. But I, I, I couldn't take my eyes off the suspect. And I decided I needed to take cover. So I looked to my left and there was a black Cadillac about eight feet away. And when I looked back at him, he was really calm. He said, you'll never make it. So I thought he was going to try and shoot me, which mm -hmm. was okay with me because I was going to you know, take cover. And I turned my shotgun away from him, but I kept my eyes on him. And he lifted the baby by one arm and killed the baby and blood got on me. And um, I ended up, I was already in motion. So I ended up going behind the car. The baby is still alive screaming and he runs across the parking lot and he's behind a car across the parking lot. I'm looking under the car and seeing him go from wheel to wheel. So I get to the back of my car and I get on the hood and I figure if he sticks his head up, he's basically free game. And when I'm looking, I can see in the curvature of the windshield, I can see movement. I got ready to pull the trigger and then I heard a gunshot and I duck. And I'm thinking, where is he? Where is he shooting at? What is he shooting at? And then just then the streets filled with cop cars, UCLA police, LAPD, Highway Patrol, Santa Monica Police Department. They were all there. And, and so one of the older LAPD officers said, we call a SWAT team. Hang on. We're bringing a SWAT team in. And I can hear the baby crying. They were too far away to hear the baby. And I said, we can't wait. The baby's going to bleed out. We need to get there. And so it was really interesting. I, I thought when I was writing the book, I don't remember someone gave a signal, but it, it was like something we were all trained to do. We converged on foot with our weapons out. And when we got there, he was sitting against a tire with his way, legs wide open and the baby laying on its back screaming. And he had taken the gun and blown the back of his head out. And he was foaming at the mouth and saying, help me, help me. And just then two UCLA cops ran and they picked up the baby. They said, the ambulance isn't here yet. We're going to UCLA. And one of them took off his jacket and wrapped the baby in it. And he's running away as the baby's screaming. And for some reason, I turned and watched him actually get both of them get in the police car. And when I turned back, one of the other officers had turned the suspect around or the father. It was his baby laid him on the ground and he was foaming at the mouth and the paramedics got there and put the box down. He said, help me once or twice. And it was, it, it was kind of surreal because there were like three or four different color uniforms. Highway Patrol has tan. And, and uh, we just stood there and watched. He said, help me maybe once, twice, three times, I think. And then he passed and a hand landed on my shoulder. And I looked and it was a classmate of mine. He goes, Hey Mike, we're going fishing next week. You want to go? And that's how that episode ended. Wow. Well, I mean, was your friend trying to break the ice to make make that statement in the middle? <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe, but I know he fishes. <laughs> yeah. Or he used to. He ended up drinking himself to death, and he died at the beach in Redondo Beach. Uh, they found him uh, sitting on the bench staring at the ocean, and he was frozen stiff. Huh. So, so did you ever find out who this guy was that when why guy, he killed those two people? Yes, the guy, his, the woman that was screaming was his wife, and she was in a motel room in bed with another man, the guy that took off in the Cadillac, and the baby was in a bassinet at the foot of the bed, and he had followed them there. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That's the reason he went after them. Right. Now, when I wrote the book, I've done such a, unusual things because I was retired off LAPD with a broken neck and back in 1980. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of for hire stuff. And so some of the stuff I did is, for lack of a better phrase, it, pretty big stuff. And I knew I had to prove everything. And there were two things that the FBI wouldn't give me information on. I had to hire a lawyer. And the other thing was a shooting. And not that I wanted details of who the mother was or, you know, that kind of stuff. But I, I wanted to prove it for my book. Well, I got rejection letters from LAPD stating that the incident is not available for publication. So in the notes of my book, I got two of them. And my lawyer on the other case said, well, why don't you refer from the book in the, in the notes that you got those two denials of the, of the case? So yeah, they wouldn't let any information out. It was, it was a book. It was a double homicide. It's called because hmm. the baby died, of course. Wow. So you were an LAPD cop for a while, and then you went into private practice? Yes. I, I, I actually, interesting enough, I told you I'm dyslexic. One of the first things, I went to a couple companies, TRW and, and stuff around Torrance, and because of my injuries, I couldn't pass the physicals. 
And I went to Coca-Cola. A friend of mine worked there and said, hey, they're hiring drivers to drive trucks around. And I couldn't pass the physical. So I went home and I, I you know, thought, okay, what am I going to do? And my first wife, Manette, found a news article. It, it was interesting. This is, it's in my book and it's kind of humorous. She gave me a, a news article that they're hiring security at this location. So I went there and filled out the application and sat in a room with, I don't know, five or six other guys my age, you know, late twenties in suits. And uh, a door opened up and the hiring manager came out in a very expensive suit. And he said, Mike Powell. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, follow me, please. And I went and he sat across from his desk and he asked me, he goes, why are you here? And I said, w what are you talking about? And he said, I said, I'm here for the job, like everyone else. And he goes, I'm looking at your resume. It's pretty impressive. He goes, you were trained in mountain warfare, explosives and sniper tactics. I said, well, yes, in the Marine Corps. And he goes, in, in the Marine Corps, you were awarded a, a medal at Edison Range by the, the colonel there, Colonel Councilman, because you shot nine out of 10 bullseyes from 900 yards without a scope. I said, yes, sir. And he looked down at the paper and he looked up and he said, just out of curiosity, how big is a bullseye? I said, oh, about the size of a man's chest. And he, he looks at me, he goes, Mike, this is Nordstrom's. It's a department store. <laughs> and obviously, I did, obviously, I didn't get the job. Yeah, uh, interesting. So, when did when did the you know the private detective and and some of those you, about the mafia? You mentioned the mafia. Now, what was that story about? I did a couple things, and one day I had a visitor come. I was in, in a bar, and he knew my name. He walked up, put a business card down. He worked for a company called Intercept, which is owned by Ed Gell, president of the American Polygraph Association. Ed polygraphed OJ. The the uh, Ramses and on and on and on. And they, he said, you know, we're looking for someone to go undercover for us. And I said, no, I, I don't do that stuff anymore. And he said, well, hear me out. And he said that he had interviewed five or six retired federal agents, DEA, FBI, uh, LA County sheriffs and LAPD, and every one of them turned the job down. He goes, you want to know why? And I go, yeah, why? He goes, we need someone to go undercover in the mafia in Las Vegas for the federal government. Well, you know, this might go in, into the psychology of, you know, being bullied and not wanting to be afraid. Mm -hmm. When he said that, I was hooked. I mean, I actually liked the fact that they were afraid and I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I said, I can be on a plane in, in two days. And it was a case that was basically, you might call off the books operation. The Gillette Corporation in Boston financed it. The federal government, U.S. Postal Inspectors, it was a boiler room operation. They were ripping people off for $100 million a year. And Tony Spilatro, I don't know if you know the name, if you've seen Casino, Joe Pesci played him in the movie. He was in, he was the enforcer for the outfit in Chicago. The 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 mafia in Chicago is called the outfit. They've always called themselves the outfit, and uh, they were involved in the skimming at the Stardust Hotel, which FBI files say is about five to eight million dollars a year. They were skimming, but they had like two to three hundred employees selling fraudulent ballpoint pens, paper mate, Hallmark greeting cards, and on and on, and they were raking in a hundred million dollars a year. And Ken Clow, who was former CIA, was head of worldwide security for the, for the Gillette Corporation, got together with the U.S. attorney in Las Vegas, Lamont Mills, and they got an informant and they were working with the U.S. Postal Inspector investigators. And they were trying to gather information that every, because if, if someone was fraudulently saying something on the phone, these companies can say, oh, he wasn't supposed to say that, we're going to fire him. So they needed to prove that the whole organization was involved in this scam. And so they started working with an informant for about three, four months, and he disappeared. And I've heard rumors. I try to verify it in my book. I say I have not been able to verify it, but I was told by the people that hired me uh, out of uh, Intercept in Hollywood, California, that they found him. He was executed in a, a motel and a rag was stuffed down his throat with a broom handle. And so the feds figured that it was already busted. They, you know, they already know we're trying to get them and they wouldn't put anyone of their own agents undercover. And Gillette had hired Intercept and th there, I have documents where they started the preliminary investigation. But once they learned that Tony Spilatro was the enforcer, everyone told them that people were talking to them along Vegas and in, in different cities, Florida, and, and it was a big operation, Arizona, to, to stay away from there. 
you know, it, it was pretty dangerous. So they couldn't get anyone to go under. The feds didn't want to put anyone under. So the Gillette Corporation called Ed Gelb and Intercept and said, we need, a, you know, someone who does this kind of stuff and who's willing to do it. And in two days, I was on a plane. Tony Spilatra. So how do you get in the middle of that? Well, it was pretty common sense to me. I knew when, when I arrived in Vegas, Intercept had got me a car and got me a hotel room. The first thing I did was dump those things. I don't know their procedures. I, it was a new company to me. I never even went to their offices. So I didn't know if they left a paper trail. What I did back then, you know, probably can't, couldn't be done today because of the internet. Mm -hmm. But what I did is I ended up moving to another place and I went to, uh, it was called 50 State Distribution. And I went there and I was like 30 years old at the time. And I watched kids or 38 year, or 30 year olds leaving. And I saw two guys that looked like, you know, I could hang with these guys if I, you know, saw them on a basketball court or something. And I followed them to a bar down the street and they went in and sat at the bar. I sat behind them at a table, ordered a sandwich and a and a Diet Coke, and they were talking to the bartender, and they all, I picked up that they were all from Chicago, the bartender too, and uh, they were eating hoagies and stuff, and when they got up to leave, the guy tapped the dead plane and said, we'll see you tomorrow. So I went back to my hotel room, and I called Intercept. Now, there were other boiler room operations around Vegas going on at the time from other organized crime organizations. The operations were 20 employees, 30 employees, maybe even 40 employees, 50 state had 200 employees. Now, the documents at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal even says 300 employees. But at the time, I recall them telling me 200 employees making phone sales. So I had to get in there. And the night before, two feds came and visited me in my hotel room. And they spent the whole, they were young. And I understand they didn't want to work with me because... Law enforcement doesn't like working with private people, mm -hmm. private investigators, securities or anything. They, they just don't like it. They feel uncomfortable. And I understood that. But they, they spent about 20 minutes trying to convince me how I couldn't get in. Number one, you had to be sponsored to get in. So, like another employee had to say, hey, I've known him for a long time. He can get, you know, he can do the work. And number two, there were 200 employees. And in the middle of the building was a lunchroom. And two to three mobsters from Chicago hung out there every day. It was their, like their, the, the brain room. And they said, we need to get those guys on tape, you know, talking about how they know everything's illegal. They said, it'll take you six months to a year to get in. Back then, I was kind of cocky. Uh, I talk about that in the book. And I said, I'll be in by the end of the week. They picked up their briefcase and they left. Mm -hmm. So the next day, as I said, I followed these guys at the bar. They said they'd be, we'll see you tomorrow. I went to my room. I called uh, Intercept. I said, I need the phone numbers and addresses of the other places, other sales rooms in Vegas. So I got those and I wrote them down on a pad of paper. I went to the bar about 20, 30 minutes before I knew they were going to arrive. And I sat way down at the end of the bar away from them. And I ordered a sandwich and a Diet Coke and I was making notes. I asked the bartender, their friend, to come over and ask them where a certain address was. And he said, oh, that's over there, this and that. I go, thanks. And I write a little bit of directions. A little while later, I asked him for another one. He says, what, are you looking for work? And I said, yeah, a couple of years ago, I was selling gold out of Newport Beach on the phone. And I want to open my own phone operation. And I showed him a scar on my neck where I had a lamidectomy from a police car crash. I didn't tell him it was from a police car crash. And I said, I was in a bad accident and finally got my settlement. I got $200,000 in the bank and I'm going to use that money to open my own phone sales, but I want to brush up on it first. That's why I want to go to work for someone to brush up, see how it's done. I've been out of the loop for a while. And he goes, oh yeah, yeah, it's over there. Gave me the addresses. Then he walked down the end of the bar. So I'm sitting there eating my sandwich and the two guys walk in and they sit down and Every, they're leaning over the bar and he's leaning and every once in a while they're glancing down at me. And I don't know, took about 10 minutes. They slid down the bar and sat next to me and said, we understand you're looking for work. And uh, you know why they slid down? Mm -hmm. They want to get their hands on my $200,000. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, I'm looking at this place, H&S Specialties here. And they go, you don't want to work there. Those places are no good. You need to go to work for 50 state distribution. And I laughed. I said, yeah, I know who they are. You can't get in there unless you know someone. And the guy closest to me turned his head and they looked at each other and looked back at me and said, you know us? And I go, oh, you work there? And he goes, yeah. He goes, you know where the cheetah is? Who's a 
mob owned strip bar in Vegas. And I did know where it was, but I pretended not to. I said, no, where, where is that? And they told me, they said, meet us there tonight at nine o'clock in the parking lot. So I go there that night and I'm in the parking lot and they're all hands all over me to see if I'm wired and talking to me and telling me that they're going to vouch for me. And he says, you know what that means? And I said, oh, yeah, I guess I, I know. And he goes, that means I'm vouching for you. I'm responsible for you. So don't F up. I said, OK. So we go to this front door. And they're young. So I'm thinking these guys can't be connected, connected. But we go in the front door and the, there's a line and the bouncer moves out of the way and lets them go in. And I'm walking with them. We go over to the left and we go to a VIP area. And there's two Italian gentlemen in suits sitting there with half naked girls on their laps. Look like a bouncer behind them, a big, big guy. And one of the guys, his name was Polly, told me to sit down probably 12 feet away from where they were, the music was pounding and, uh, you know, I couldn't hear anything anyway. And he went over and was whispering in this guy's ear. And the guy looks down at me like this and they talk. So we sat there for about 20 minutes, they exchanged information. And he walks over, leans over to me, Polly does, and says, Tony Spilatro wants to meet you. I said, oh, okay. So I go over and I go to shake his hand and he grabs my hand and he puts his other hand on it and he yanks me down to his level and he whispers in my ear. He said, you be a good boy. I said, yes, sir. Went outside. They said, go to 50 State tomorrow, knock on the door. Everything will be set up. Don't worry. I go in. There's another Tony there. They call him Fat Tony, but don't call him fat to his face. And they'll take care of you. And that's how I got in. And I got on the phone and I called Boston. I called Ken Clow and I said, I'm in. I got the okay from Tony Spilatro. And it was like dead silence on the phone for a minute. Two days later, my room was filled with probably eight to 10 federal agents who flew in from Washington and California and different places. This was an organization that they were trying to get. And we made, we made a deal. I, the first thing they said is we want, we want to get a warrant for you to wear a wire. I said, okay, I have a few things I'd like to lay on the table. Number one, I'm going to wear a wire when I feel like it, not when you feel like it. And number two is I need a, a guarantee from you that in all reports from the bus to the court records and everything, I'm not referred to as an informant. I'm referred to as an agent of or an investigator. I said, otherwise, I'm going to get on a plane. I'm out of here because they'll kill me. They said, uh, okay, we'll do that. And and they kept their promise. So I went under and uh, they set up a war room in North Las Vegas at a post office where the where back half of the warehouse wasn't being used. And they brought in about 12 agents from Texas and California with computers and different stuff. And they had three guys in a van who would listen in when I did wear a wire 50 state put me through a school on how everything operates. The first three days was basically, you know, fill out this form, fill out that form, fill out this form. But I found interesting, it was like Fort Knox. They have the sales room with maybe 50, 60, 70 cubby holes carpeted with people making calls. Then they have in another part of the building, a verification room. In the other part of the building, they have the shipping department. In another part of the building, they have the business office. And you couldn't get they were all electronic doors. You could not get from one to the other. And they came to work at different times. So it was kind of like the uh, the jewelry stores where you walk in and they buzz the first glass door open. And you walk in a little five by five and they won't open the other door till the first one shut. And uh, I guess it was two days later, I'm sitting in the uh, room with a couple of Italian guys. I'm not kidding, eating cannolis and drinking anisette and just kicking back. And so uh, we started our operation. Now, one of the things that I realized growing up, I'm dyslexic, but I've, I, I've discovered I have other uh, talents, you might say. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's like I, I almost have a photographic memory. Mm -hmm. um, and that helped me solve a lot of cases on the police department or track down, uh, like I tracked down a, a young serial killer who killed a 10 year old boy within three hours. But when we, what was happening is these people would make a call on the phone to businesses and gas stations, pool companies, and to sell them ballpoint pens or Hallmark greeting cards or whatever with the name of their company on the back. But they weren't Hallmark greeting cards and they weren't paper mate pens. Gillette Corporation owned paper mate. They were financing the investigation. So they would, they would lie and say, you won a prize, you this, whatever it took. The lie didn't matter to get the person to buy. And then they say, we're going to put your pens in a box and you want a diamond ring. I can't tell you how much it's worth, 
But if you have a pencil, I'm going to write down or pen. I'm going to I want to give you a number. It's an insurance number that I have to insure it for in the U.S. mail for two thousand dollars. And then they rattle off some number off the top of their head. But they write it down and it goes to verification. Verification calls them back to make sure that they're going to get the package so someone doesn't rip off the ring. So it's this whole process. And I would stand next to them and, and it was pretty easy. You just, I went over and, you know, one, one thing I knew from the beginning is these mobsters, you know, they have very big egos and they're greedy. So you have to feed into their, their greed, it, with a, which I did with the $200,000 and their ego, because I constantly went up to people and said, you know what? I heard you're really good. You're one of the best. Can, can I sit in on your calls and listen mm -hmm. to you? And then they would, you know, basically lie. They would dial the number, lie, talk to the person, get the sales done. And I was wearing a wire. And then about, I would get to work about five. And then at noon, I would drive off, drive around a little bit in Las Vegas. And then I'd head out to the war room. Uh, there I would meet the other guys in the van and we would play back what they said. And I would marry faces to DMV photos or faces to criminal files. Mm -hmm. And we'd say, okay, this is John, this is Joe, this is Charlie. But the thing we needed to do was gather the evidence. So this was a big operation. So they had postal inspectors in different states arrive at the gas station or and say, you're going to get a package, don't open it, call us right away so they can collect it as evidence. But the thing is, we needed the phone number to these places because we didn't see the address. So mm -hmm. they don't say the phone number when they're talking, but back then they had push button phones and I could remember how they, the pattern they pushed hmm. and we would go set a phone in front of me and I'd say, oh, that's John. I think it's this. And I would say 65 to 75% of the time I knew the number matching the phone call and they got their evidence and it was enough to get 200 blank grand jury subpoenas. They snuck a hundred federal agents in the Nellis Air Force Base, didn't tell the Metropolitan Police, didn't tell the FBI, didn't tell anyone locally. They picked me up one morning and took me to a hangar in Nellis. And it, this was interesting. They Wayne Gray, who was in charge of the investigation was standing up on the platform and he, he introduced me and they actually gave me a standing ovation. They had been trying to get into this organization and I'll explain why in a minute, not just for the phone sales, but for money laundering and a lot of other things. And then Wayne said, um, okay, I know who you guys are up front. U.S. Postal Inspectors, would you gentlemen in the back introduce yourself? And one guy would stand up and say, my name's John Jones. We're from the IRS. There's six of us. Officially, we're not here. He'd sit down. Another guy would stand up. You know, we're from the uh, DEA. Officially, we're not here. The Treasury Department. It would just went on and on and on. So when I, uh, and I explain it in the book, when I say 100, you can look back and the newspaper articles from here say 67, 77, the uh, papers from United, uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals says 43. So there's all kinds of stories about how many, but that's why it's misleading is officially they weren't there. They took down that operation, but Oscar Goodman, I don't know if you know who Oscar is. Oscar was a mob attorney. He actually played himself in casino. Joe Pesci played Nick Tantoro, who was actually modeled after Tony, Tony the Ant Spilatro. Mm -hmm. And Oscar Goodman was the first lawyer on the scene. I met him out front. He got it thrown out of court for illegal search and seizure because they got all this evidence on money laundering and the warrants were for wire and mail fraud. But it went to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said that in the process of looking for wire and mail fraud, if you find other illegalities, that you can prosecute for that as well. So it upheld and now sets precedence for search and seizure laws in the United States of America. And interestingly enough is Oscar Goodman played himself in the casino at the end. And there's a podcast called Mobbed Up the Fight for Las Vegas that mm -hmm. the Mob Museum put on. Yeah. With, and, and the season three is about Oscar Goodman. I'm in my stories in episode two. And unfortunately they taped me two years ago before I had a chance to finish my book or write my book, Escaping the Kill Zone. Hmm. Do you know uh, Lisa Caserta? Lisa Caserta, no. Lisa Caserta, I met her in Topanga Canyon. Uh, she was in doing some stuff with the mob. She was Henry Hill's girlfriend. And we had Henry Hill's life rights after Goodfellas that we developed a show called Witsec. It was mm -hmm. about him going in witness protection. 
but you know, I think she somehow they were tied to that mob museum or something. Maybe I don't know if it was memorabilia or whatever, but that was a, a very, very in, interesting scenario to me that you got a guy who's supposed to be running from the mob and witness protection. And he's hanging out in Topanga Canyon and painting paintings, but very, very interesting. So when this went down, where, what was your next move? What, what was, you know, you're only 30 years old, right? What what did you do following, you know, this this thing with the mob? Well, one of the things I did, as I said, I did some stuff before they asked me to do this case. Uh, my wife found another news article to hire someone or looking for executive security. And so I jumped in my car, went up to Tw Twin Towers. We call them Twin Towers in Century City. And that interview was different. A guy pulled out a gun, put it on the table. He said, what kind of gun is this? I told him. He said, strip it down. I stripped it down. I put it back together. He liked the fact that I was a retired L.A. cop. I had a CCW. I could carry a weapon. And I was a, I was a sergeant in the Marine Corps Reserves. He was a former Marine Corps sergeant. And they hired me. Mm -hmm. Executive protection for a publisher. So I drove home and I walk in. My wife said, how'd it go? I said, oh, I got the job. She said, who are you going to be protecting? I said, I don't know, some guy in a gold-plated wheelchair. He was shot a few years ago. And she goes... Larry Flint? I go, yeah, that's him. I had no idea who Larry Flint was, but mm -hmm. she's from the East Coast and she knew who he was. So I became a bodyguard to Larry Flint. Now, a lot of people say they were Larry Flint's bodyguard. I mean, the outside crew and the crews at the offices went and come, but there was a inner circle, about four or five of us that traveled with him, took care of him. I was allowed in and out of his suite. He had a bedroom suite with a 700 pound electronic door. He bought Sonny Bono's house. He sandbagged the walls, bulletproof glass. He was paranoid and drugged up 99% of the time. Mm -hmm. And um, that got pretty, I was with him for about a year. I got really close to him. One side of the family or the security didn't like how close I was. And the family was asking me to intervene because they felt security and other people involved were trying to gain uh, control of the $500 million corporation. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, drugged in the middle of that. In the middle of the Larry Flynn. What was it? What was he like? He must've been a smart guy or a good businessman. You, I was, Mimi said that you said something about, he tried to put a hit on somebody. Larry was, you know, Al Goldstein who, had another porn magazine. Uh, when I was doing my research, I ran across, he said, Larry Flynn is one of the nicest guys I've ever met and probably one of the most dangerous guys I've ever met. So Larry would do interesting stuff like he had a problem with Frank Sinatra. I don't know what that was. He had a problem with, of course, Hugh Hefner. He had a problem with Bob Guccione, a pen, a Penthouse Magazine, and Walter Annenberg. And uh, he put a contract, a hit out on him, million dollar hit to a guy to kill all four of them. Now, the L.A. County Sheriff's Department, Sheriff Block, mm -hmm. has, uh, has the uh, check that was never cashed because the Mitchell uh, Werbel, the gentleman that was given the contract, he was former OSS and had worked in Cuba, in Indonesia, and uh, that, that's a precursor to uh, the CIA. He passed away before he got to pull the trigger on any of them. Uh, I don't know today why Larry Flint wanted to kill Sinatra. I had a pretty good idea why he wanted to kill the others. But mm. yeah, that's what I was talking about. I mentioned it in my book, and uh, I said, I wish I knew. The, the, the guys I worked with and traveled with, with Larry Flint, were all former military, like myself. They were doing side work. And they would come up to me, and one of them in particular, uh, William Metzer, would come up to me and ask me if I wanted to team up with those guys and do some side work. We're making some good money. No one knows cash under the table and stuff. And they were doing hits for money. They were killing people. And one of the murders, they, they, in 1983, after I was long gone, they got arrested in the Cotton Club murder in, in Los Angeles. And mm -hmm. they got arrested for killing a prostitute in Beverly Hills. And they were investigated for another murder, two other, another two murders. One of them in Florida was a drug deal, a drug dealer connected to the Medellin drug cartel. But those are the guys I hung with. And, but, you know, in this business, I, I write in my book that, you know, you, sometimes you're sitting next to some people that you wouldn't otherwise be sitting next to if you weren't in this 
in this business. There's good guys and bad guys, and you have to know the difference. Did you ever know a guy named Dan Chandler? Dan and, Chandler. Uh, he was uh, president, hired and fired at Caesars nine times during <laughs> that 70s and 80s years. I was partners with Nick Cassavetes on a project. We raised some money, paid Nick to write a script. We never made the never made the movie, but it's about the bluegrass conspiracy. And it was about Ben uh, Happy Chandler's kids. And one of his sons, Ben Chandler was the good one. Dan Chandler was the guy that hired and fired in Caesars. But he was good friends with the Colombians who hired Woody Harrelson's dad. They put a hit on a federal judge, I think, for mm -hmm. the first time was the story. But, you know, Dan was a big figure. I think he knew Larry Flint around that time. And there's a guy that owns a golf course in the middle of Vegas. It's like the best piece of property there is. And I can't remember his name because he gave Steve us some Wynn? money. Steve Wynn? Not, it wasn't Steve Wynn. It was another fella that has the golf course. It's right on the strip. It's kind of low key, but he gave us some money. But that whole world of Vegas and it was a very, very interesting time, you know, how kind yeah. of there was a mix of Hollywood uh, and these kind of criminal lifestyles. They kind of intermingled, you know. Yeah. And Larry was a big gambler. And so uh, Gene Kilroy, he was Muhammad Ali's guy. He uh, also worked at Caesar's Palace. He would do favors for me, pick me up at the uh, executive airport, uh, uh, have me picked up in a limousine and stuff, introduced me to Joe Lewis. I was supposed to have dinner two weeks before Lewis died. I was supposed to have dinner with him, and he, they called and said he wasn't feeling well. So I didn't get to do that. But they knew that I had Larry's ear. It was kind of interesting how I got close to, to, to Larry, I mean, really close. When I was writing my book, I even stopped. And I thought, geez, was I really that close? I mean, I sat next to his bed, you know, most of the time. And Los Angeles Magazine article I have here, I went through and read it again. And it was called, the article's called Porn Again. That's when he kind of turned religious. And he says in there that uh, Althea and Larry's favorite bodyguard was Mike Powell. It says it right there in black and white. And so uh, I got close to him. I mean, a funny story is they he, he gambles. He drops a lot of money, so the, the the other hotels would like him to come stay there, and that's why Gene was trying to constantly trying to get me to get Larry there. But he he liked to start his hotel. So one day we took him to uh, a place called the Silverbird. It's not around anymore. I think it had a name, the Rancho, one time, or and he was they were going to play poker, and they they took over the Baccarat room at two kind of moon shaped walls with windows, moon shaped with windows and people could look in and we pushed his gold plated wheelchair up and he uh, was sitting there with four world champions. Gabe Kaplan from Welcome Back Cotta. He, he won one of the world championship things. Amarillo Slim, Puggy the Owl and Stewie Unger. I don't know if you know who that is. Stewie is three time world champion. They made a movie about him. He ended up dying of drug overdoses and stuff. But they're all gambling and with lots of money, you know, and security, his security unit, we we're all dressed in black suits, black ties, white shirts, sunglasses. They're, they're gambling and he looks over his shoulder and calls me over. So I walk over and he says, um, Mike, you know how to play poker? And I said, well, yes, sir. You know, I played with my brothers growing up and I kind of joke the one I played was Indian poker where you put the one up facing out on your head and you can't yeah. see it, but everyone else can. So he says, well, I tell the guys I got to go to the restroom and uh, I want you to sit in for me. So I said, okay. So I sat down and they laid the cards, half of them down and half of them up. I have no idea what this game is. And Amarillo is right next to me. And he said, oh, you got to put some more chips in. So I grabbed some and go, no, no, the black ones. So I'm throwing chips in and Gabe Kaplan actually told him, leave the kid alone, you know, and we're doing it. And it went pretty fast. I mean, they sat there, and, you know, a few seconds here, a few seconds there. And next thing you know, Stu Younger reached over and he drug all these chips towards him. So they pushed Larry up to the table and he goes, how'd you do? I looked over, I said, uh, I think I lost. And he said, how much did you lose? I go, I don't know. I have no idea. And Stewie was stacking the money. Didn't even look up. He goes, uh, Mike lost $30,000. And Larry busted up laughing. That's the most expensive piss, piss I've ever taken. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Incredible stories. So as far as the, the book goes, wh where can we find the book? Where do we get the book? The book is on Amazon. There's a copy of it. And uh, by the way, uh, if, I don't know if you see the top of that. The marketing company that helped me put the book together 
wanted to send it to Kirkus Review. It's one of the top review companies in the, the, the country. They've been around 90 years, one of the top two. And they gave me a great review. You can read on Amazon. You can type in Mike J. Powell and my book will come up or Escaping the Kill Zone, My Journey from LAPD Zebra Unit to Undercover Federal Operative in the Las Vegas Mafia. And wow. uh, that's where you can get it. And, and if you just want to read the first chapter, the, cha the reason that the book has flames on it and it says Escaping the Kill Zone, which is basically a military term, it's because uh, at the end, I ended my career on, a, I guess, a big, a big upswing or downswing. Uh, they lit my house on fire with my first wife and I in it. I tell the story, it's the first chapter, you can read it for free. And I was getting death threats. My wife's running around trying to get the cat. The house is filling with smoke. And she looks and sees that the back door, sliding glass doors out to the swimming pool is not burning. And she runs to the door and says, we can get out this way. And she grabbed the door handle when I grabbed her by the forearm and pulled her away. And I said, no, that's the kill zone. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me, what are you talking about? And I say in the book, I never really told her you know, I would leave for weeks and she would know where I was. But that's that an area that a sniper would set up. And I knew the guys that were giving me death threats were involved in two high powered rifle shootings in Columbus, Ohio. So that was the kill zone. So we had to go out through the flames in the front. And wow. um, that's where we got the title. So how, how do you, before we close up here and the show, where, how do you deal with, you know, these experiences? You know, how do you let that weight go? How do you know? I'm, uh, I have some spirituality going on. I'm a clairsentient. I feel things. I can read people. How do you feel now? Have you been able to let go of those experiences and, and then move on? Or you still carry some of that weight with you? I, I believe I still carry some weight with me. I mean, I've been in and out of therapy for 50 years. You know, you know when the baby died, the, when he shot that baby, of course, um, you know, you start thinking, you know, what could you have done differently? You know, was it my fault? And and I, I go in the book, you know, I went through a drinking spell. And because of my surgeries, I was, you know, taking pills and drinking and getting in bar fights and getting pulled up for drunk driving. And basically in the area I lived, you know, a lot of the officers, both in the sheriff's department stuff, knew who I was and, and they took me home. I know it's not right, but that's what we did back then. We took care mm -hmm. of our own. And yeah, and, and interestingly enough, I was uh, not going to therapy for years until I wrote the book. And when I wrote the book, I had to find a therapist out here in Henderson. I live about 20 minutes from the Strip, 25 minutes from the Strip in Henderson, Nevada. I had to find a therapist and it's like starting all over again. One of the interesting things about this book, for years I felt bad, and, and I, I talk about it in the book, I felt bad for what I did, and it's it's kind of a mixed bag. You feel proud of what you did, and uh, that the stories we talked about here are just you know a handful. There's more, and mm -hmm. uh, even a bigger one, a bigger case uh, that the feds got involved and uh, were th threatening to indict me if I didn't turn over information to them. And uh, the people were paying me to want me to give them the information. So it, it was kind of interesting. What was that case for a teaser? Oh, a, a teaser was uh, Larry Flynn and Bob Guccione hated each other. Mm -hmm. And so they were writing bad things about each other in each other's magazine. And Larry Flynn would write bad things about Kathy, uh, forget her name, his, his uh, uh, live-in wife or uh, girlfriend, uh, Guccione's. And one day uh, Larry Flynn thought it'd be funny to superimpose Guccione's face on two gay guys having sex in bed and he superimposed it on the guy getting it from behind and uh, printed it and Guccione took him to federal court in Columbus, Ohio and sued him for $80 million and the the jury awarded him $39.6 million. I was long gone from Larry Flint a couple years and I got contacted and uh, Bob Guccione wanted to meet with me had me fly out to his house him and Bruckman, his attorney, who was Jerry Falwell's attorney, and Doris Duke, the tobacco heiress, and these attorneys and them, and they said that it's in my book. It's kind of split up because it's kind of a twist, but mm -hmm. they offered me a million dollars if I can prove that Larry Flint bribed the federal judge because the federal judge dropped the $39.6 million jury award down to $4 million. The wow. twist the twist is, is I knew Guccione knew that I was with Larry when he bribed the judge, and I knew he knew, and I did. I took the case anyway and did the case. Mm -hmm. So wow. my muscles went up in flames. Wow. Interesting. Well, 
Mike, I appreciate you coming on the show. We, we've been talking about an hour and 10 minutes here, but I appreciate you coming on the show. I think some great conversations, some great material. If you're looking for a great book, Escaping the Kill Zone by Mike J. Powell. Some very, very interesting stories. Look forward to seeing that on the big screen one day. I think you got a shot at it. Very intriguing story. And I know it's a memoir about your life. And I think it takes a special person to do what you've done and go through these experiences and keep going. This has been author, former officer, former investigator, Mike J. Powell. I'm John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bang Productions. Thank you.